My name is Willie Poinsett, and I want to welcome you to Respond to Racism community meeting. I am one of the co-founders, and I am so delighted that you have joined us tonight. We started in July 2017, and we've been going ever since. We met in person until COVID hit and we went online and I'm hoping, I want to go back because I want to see your faces and feel your energy. And so I'm looking forward to in-person meetings, I hope soon. And I'm saying that I hope we'll maybe we'll have a hybrid with in-person and mm -hmm. online. So with that, I want to just have you get centered and ready for our meeting. Tonight, one of our active Youth Empowerment Committee members, Karuna, will be reading the land acknowledgement. Karuna. Hello. Today, I would like to honor the people whose lands we live on, the Malala, the Cayuse, the Tualatin Kalapuya, the Willamette Tumwater, the Waska Wishram, the Klaspamish Chinook, and other Chinook people of the Willamette area. We acknowledge those tribes as the original inhabitants of the land and recognize their forced removal from their land. Land acknowledgments are more than just explanations name-checking the tribes and native nations whose lands we occupy. These statements help demonstrate respect for and awareness of the enduring relationship between indigenous people and place. Acknowledgements do not exist in a past tense or historical context. Colonialism is a current ongoing process and it behooves us to seek and build an understanding of our present participation. Thank you, Karuna, for the land acknowledgement. Let us get ourselves ready now for our meeting. And let me start by going over our mission. Our mission from Respond to Racism is to educate and empower Lake Oswego residents and institutions and those who are not in our area with the tools to combat racism in all forms and make Lake Oswego in Oregon. And if you are in another state, include your place to a better place to live and work and play for all of our residents of all races and ethnicities. And tonight, as we begin our program, we have some gratitudes, some acknowledgements, but I want to first start with a moment of silence. Some of you may or may not have heard that Sandy Williams of Spokane, a civil rights activist, lost her life because she was one of the people on board of the float plane that crashed up in near the Puget Sound. Sandy Williams was a creator of Black Lens. And Black Lens is a newspaper. And she did that because she wanted to give voice to African Americans, stories, and their perspectives. This is a big loss for that community. And let's just hold not only Sandy's family, but all of the families of the people who lost their lives. A moment of silence, please.
Thank you. Tonight, I want to just give some gratitude. First of all, I am happy to announce for those of you who may not have read the article or seen any of the postings, but Bruce Aubrey Davis points at my son was nominated and he has been identified as the one of the amazing neighbor for Lake Oswego. The Pamplin uh, publishers, publishers acknowledged across uh, the county and the areas from different cities, amazing neighbors. And he was selected or nominated, and we don't know who nominated him as the amazing neighbor, neighbor because they said in that quote, Bruce has amplified the voices of minority community members through student columns and oral histories. Thank you for whomever nominated him. And congratulations, Bruce. Thank you. In last month's panel, we want to recognize those people who served on the panel. And we had students, the students, Sarah, Karen, Samantha, Cameron, and Bruce was the moderator. And they shared their stories, their perspectives on how they felt about the renewal of the two-year contract for the school resource officers. It was hard, but I want to congratulate and thank those panelists and thank Bruce for moderating it. You heard the students' voices. And now it's time to do our poll. We always give you something to do when you leave the meeting. And so just answer, it's a yes or no, and then we'll move on. Did you take at least one action to support students who have not been heard on the decision to renew the SRO contract and let us know what you did by putting it in the chat. Our agreements for tonight, be brave, share your ideas, ask questions, and engage in, excuse me, the conversation. Let others speak, respectfully listen to understand and be open to new ideas. Share your unique perspective, speak honestly, critique ideas, not the people. Ask clarifying questions, respect each other's thinking, and value their contributions. Please honor, con honor confidentiality. People will share things. Honor confidentiality. Our expected outcomes will get acquainted with who's in our room or on the call or in our groups and want to respond to racism. We won't solve racism in the two hours that we're here tonight. You leave the meeting with more questions than you came with 
and you'll have one actionable item, I hope, that you will decide that you want to work on. You'll have more ideas of how you can interrupt racism. And now we're going to move to the main part of our program. And I'm going to take this opportunity to introduce the person who's going to be moderating our panel. We're talking about tonight the banned books and how we seem to be going backwards. I will say, these are my words now. This is not on any script. Going backwards, where we're going back, where we're going to put books, ban books, keep books away from people, keep education, keep knowledge away, keep the truth away. And we want to have, we don't want that. I don't want it. And so I hope you will leave here ready to do something about it or read some of the banned books so that you will know what's going on. And so our moderator, Chris Myers. Chris is the adult services librarian at the Lake Oswego Public Library. He was a board member of the Oregon Battle of the Books and the Oregon Association of School Libraries. Currently serves as the secretary of the Public Library Division of the Oregon Library Association. In his upcoming retirement, Chris plans to do some volunteering with street books when he's not sitting on his porch in Southeast Portland, exercising his freedom to read. <laughs> and with that, let us welcome Chris Myers. Welcome, Chris. John, can you unmute Chris? Okay, I think I'm unmuted now. Sorry. He is now. Okay. <laughs> I would have brought the panel discussion to a screeching halt. Um, thank you so much for uh, that introduction, Willie, and for inviting me and my fellow librarians to be part of this discussion, part of this panel about uh, a topic that's really important to libraries and of course should be important to all of us who care about um, ideas and the freedom to express ourselves and uh, the freedom to learn and educate ourselves about a broad range of ideas. Um, before I get too far into the discussion, I want to introduce our panelists and I'm so glad they are willing to take part in this conversation. Miranda Doyle is a district librarian of Lake Oswego School District. She's currently serving as a member of the Oregon Intellectual Freedom Committee and is the intellectual freedom advocate for the Oregon Association of School Libraries. When she isn't defending the freedom to read, Miranda enjoys running, kayaking, and learning Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. Joni is a sophomore at Lake Oswego High School and is active in the Youth Empowerment Committee. Joni enjoys learning about new people, their culture, and experiences. Abby Atonio Hafner is a parent, Lake Oswego School District substitute teacher, active PTO member and president, helping with the opening of the Palisades World Language School and an avid lover of books and literature. She is firmly committed to turning the tide of racism in Lake Oswego. Karuna is a senior at Lake Oswego High School. She's active in the Youth Leadership Council and the Youth Empowerment Committee. Karuna is passionate about languages and is interested in pursuing a career in medicine. My colleague Andrea Milano is the Youth Services and Technical Services Manager at the Lake Oswego Public Library. Andrea has served on the American Library Association's Intellectual Freedom Committee, as well as on the 2012 Newberry Medal Committee. She's an advocate for the rights of children to read what they want to read whenever the moment hits them. 
Emily is a senior at Lake Ridge High School. She's a dedicated advocate for students as authentic partners in making decisions affecting their education. Emily currently serves as a student advisor to the Oregon State Board of Education and is executive director of Oregon Student Voice. So thank you panelists for being here and I hope all of you will feel free to um, jump in and express your views on this topic. Um, as, a, as a starting point, uh, I would say uh, that efforts to ban books um, are as old as books themselves and have been more or less continuous through the history of publishing. However, in the last 18 months in the United States, we have seen a new wave and a new kind of type and quality uh, to these challenges. Certainly per, uh, as pertinent to this group, race is a big factor in this uh, newest wave of challenges. And I, th I thought I'd throw this to Miranda first because of her background uh, in intellectual freedom. Miranda, could you kind of give us the, uh, a survey of, of this newest, um, newest wave of challenges? Where do they come from and w w what are they all about? Thank you. I was also not able to unmute. Um, so yes, as Chris mentioned, we've always had book challenges and books removed from libraries, um, school libraries and public libraries. And when I say challenge, what I mean is we've had parents or community members come to the library and say, or to the school district and say, we don't think this book is appropriate. We don't think it should be in the library. And what they're saying is not just, I don't want my student to read that book, but I don't want anyone to have access to it in the library. And so we call that a challenge because it's don't always succeed. Fortunately, um, it, they go through a process and often we decide or that, we're, that that is a book that should be in the library for everybody and um, are able to retain it. So when we talk about banned books, we're talking often about books that have been removed. Um, of course, not everywhere. You know, you can get a banned book at the, the bookstore, for example. Usually they're not removed from bookstores, but um, for our students to have access, it needs to be in the school library and in the public library. So it's really important that those not be banned. Um, but challenges, we have always had some. Um, I've been with Lake Oswego School District. This is my 12th year. And we have had um, community members who have said, why do you have this book? I'm not, I don't think you should have it. It has never yet, hopefully, fingers crossed, risen to the level of we're formally challenging this and we're taking it to the school board to ask that it be removed. It's usually resolved in a conversation about intellectual freedom and why we have the books and why not everyone has to read it. Um, you don't have to read a book that you don't object, that you don't like, your student doesn't have to read it. Um, so this has always been a thing that happens, but as Chris mentioned, it has, I think the statistic is the number of challenges quadrupled in 2021. And I can't even imagine where they are now. I haven't seen the latest statistics. And the way they're being challenged has changed. Instead of it being one community member or a small group saying, um, maybe their child brings home a book and they say, oh, I can't believe this is in the library. I don't like this. Um, instead, it tends now to be huge lists of books circulated by political groups. Um, it's very um, political right now. Legislators are passing laws. Librarians are being sued. They're being threatened with arrest and prosecution. Um, they're being called groomers. They're attacked on social media. Um, teachers are told they cannot have books in their classroom libraries um, for students to borrow. Um, it's really pretty unbelievable and it's a national trend and so when I read the news I it's easy to think this is something that happens in Florida in Texas and Oklahoma but we are having book challenges a huge increase in Oregon um, I, I feel lucky to be in a school district that is very supportive of diverse books um, and having windows and mirrors um, having our materials in the library reflect um, many different types of people and experiences. Um, 
but I know that there have been challenges very close to us in Salem and Beaverton, um, uh, all around the state. So it is very concerning. Um, and it, there are groups now, um, political groups, um, for example, the Oregon Moms Union, Moms for Liberty, um, SK, we stand together. There are these groups that are taking lists of books and checking to see if their libraries have them and then challenging them. So that's very different. And Chris, we talked a little bit about how challenges do come from every side of the political spectrum. There are people who will challenge a book because it has racist or stereotypical content um, because um, and and um, they'd like it removed. But the, the volume of the challenges, the, the most of the challenges are coming um, to books on race, on um, LGBTQ plus issues, on uh, sex education, um, topics like that. Thank you. Um, I, th I think we can make this a little more concrete by having uh, some of our panelists talk about specific books that are being challenged or that they've read that are challenged and I'm going to start with Miranda and then we're going to go to Andre and then Joni and then uh, Karuna and Emily and Abby, if you want to jump in, I, I we haven't discussed with you before this this uh, meeting, but it, feel free to, to get in there. I'm going to see if I can share my screen because I have book covers for the books that uh, Andre and Miranda and Joni were going to talk about. We'll see how it goes here. I currently... The host has disabled participant screen sharing. So I don't know if I can be made a co-host so I can share my screen. John? Oh, no, I am. Okay, great. Try now. Yep, thank you. I got it now. Thanks. All right, Miranda. Miranda is muted. There, okay. <laughs> I remember this Zoom thing. Um, so I wanted to talk about two books that have been challenged many places and some of them I hope our students are familiar with because they read them either in school or we have them in most of our libraries. And so I just want to give some examples of things that are being challenged nationally. Um, so New Kid is one of my favorite graphic novels um, and it is uh, about Jordan Banks who's a seventh grader um, and he's black and he started at a private school that is mostly white. Um, he is experiencing lots of microaggressions, lots of dealing with lots of challenges. Being a hard, new kid is hard enough, but in this environment, it's especially difficult. Um, and the author, Jerry Craft, based it on his own experiences in New York City, going to a similar private school. Um, so this one has been challenged um, to the author's surprise and to everyone's surprise as promoting um, critical race theory and Marxism. <laughs> the, Jerry Craft said he, he had to um, Google critical race theory because he's like, oh, <coughs> something I've never heard of. <laughs> so uh, it, it has been challenged in Texas and other places. And it's one where I'm very, very surprised um, because it's a very popular book and a, a great book. And I would never have guessed that it would be controversial. And you can see from this cover that it's won uh, two of the most prestigious uh, American Library Association Awards, the Newberry Medal and a Coretta Scott King Award. Okay, you ready for your second book, Miranda? Okay. Yep. All right, I think this is the most challenged book in the country right now, it has that honor. There's a great article in the New York Times about the book and the author and why it's so under attack. Um, it's about um, the author coming out as um, non-binary and asexual um, and it is a personal story and it's one that for me, we talk about windows and mirrors. We talk about books that reflect you back. Like if I'm looking in a mirror, I'm reading a book that's I can relate to, it's my experience. This one for me was a great window in that I had never even considered a lot of the things that the author goes through and talks about. And so it really opened my eyes and I can see why, I mean, it was important to me, I can see why it would be important to students. Um, 
this is an example of a book where I feel like people challenging it have not read the book. Like they are maybe reacting to screenshots of, um, it is also a graphic novel. And so there are pictures like out of context, you could say, oh yeah, that's, that's kind of shocking. But when you read the book as a whole, um, you see why it's part of the story and why it's important um, for high schoolers, especially to have access to this book. And um, it's been challenged a great deal. It's been on social media a lot, um, but it's one that I think is really important to have. And I'll add right here in Clackamas County, it was challenged very aggressively at the Canby Public Library. And I believe they retained it, but it really um, created a lot of controversy and hurt feelings and kind of divided the, the city. Mm -hmm. All right, we're gonna, thank you so much, Miranda. We're gonna go on to Andrea's titles. Hey, I was able to unmute myself, that's great. Um, so we're starting with Stamped, um, which is a version of Ibram X. Kendi's original book, which was called Stamped from the Beginning, which he wrote as an adult title and which has also been challenged. Um, this particular title, the collaboration between Jason Reynolds and Ibram X. Kendi is phenomenal. And the ability of, an author like Jason Res Reynolds, who has also, um, by the way, been challenged for some of his other work, to take the the concepts and the the story that Ibram X. Kendi wrote and make it so accessible to younger readers, um, just makes this an a, really something that is so important to have in a library collection, and it has been challenged across the country um, in some in some places because of comments that Ibram X. Kendi has made. So again, taking something completely out of context, not having read the book, but because of something that the author might have said in a public setting, um, parents and people have challenged the use of this book in history classes. And um, what I think is really sort of interesting is that there is now another version of this book, which is called Stamped for Kids, which has been written also by Jason Reynolds and Ibram X. Kendi, um, and is geared towards a six through eight, um, six through eight year old audience. Um, I've read this book, my nephew's read this book, my mom has read this book. So spanning a range of 13 years to 86, and all three of us get so much out of it. And it really demonstrates you know, the reason that these books need to be out there, especially in the public library where access is available for um, anyone and everybody. Good. And then this book, which I'm sure many, many, many of you are familiar with is really fascinating for a lot of different reasons. Um, when this book was published by Alex Gino, they titled it George. And as George in 2018, it was the number one challenged book in the country. It is the story of Melissa, who uh, was assigned the name George at birth and assigned the um, gender male at birth, but knows right from the beginning that she is Melissa. And when Alex Gino, um, maybe it was about two or three years after this book had been published, they got on social media and said, I've made a huge mistake. I told Melissa's story, but I named the book George. And um, that started a really a really um, interesting trend across the country called the Sharpie Revolution, in which uh, students were encouraged to cross out the title George and replace it with Melissa. Um, and then Alex Gino actually produced um, graphics on it on their website that we could use to adapt the books and finally this year the new edition was released by scholastic um, with this beautiful title uh, cover melissa so that's a little bit about the book another fascinating thing about this one is that it was chosen as an obob title so for those of you that aren't familiar with that the oregon battle of the books recommends 16 titles every year for students to read and um, students then 
battle out, you know, answering questions about the books um, through the course of the year. And it's something that is extremely popular in our community in Lake Oswego. And the public library, um, part of our, you know, we make it a goal to support all of those students by having lots and lots of copies of these books on our shelves. And when um, in the form of George, it was named as an OBOB selection for third through fifth graders. It just um, sparked quite a bit of controversy across, across the state. Um, school districts pulled out of OBOB altogether. Um, parents, you know, were challenging whether the book should even be on the list. And for us in a, in a public library setting, this was a really good example, a really an opportunity for us to have the conversations with parents that we like to have all the time, which is to say, you're right, there are books in this library that you may not want your child to read, but guess what, that's your decision to make. And there are hundreds of kids in this community who really want to read George or Melissa because they're so excited about Obab and they're so excited. And it will open the doors to conversations that are so important to have. Um, so this book really holds a special place in my heart and I hope all of you will get a chance to read it one day. Thank you, Andrea. Okay, Joni. Uh, last year during my freshman year, we read The Hate You Give by Angie Thomas. And this book was one of the most challenged and controversial books in American schools right now. Um, and I was fortunate enough to read this book and it was really a book that I enjoyed and related to as a person of color and a woman. Um, I found many similarities and uh, a lot of comfort with the main character, Star. Um, Star's story was based on the author, Angie Thomas, like her, her story. And she did an amazing job of portraying a teenager's experience in today's world. And uh, her struggles really just show... Uh, like the majority of struggles that teens face um, right now. And these struggles cannot be ignored. So when they're in our books, taking that literature away only really isolates teens and makes them deal with those experiences by themselves. So uh, I know a lot of the people who are trying to um, take away these books, think that maybe if we hide the truth, it'll stop it from being the truth, but that isn't the case at all. Um, we need these in our classrooms so that we can have discussions and collaboration. Um, and when we include these struggles, then we can learn to find the problems in racism and sexism and all of those issues. So it's really important that especially our youth who are gonna be making laws, making decisions, all of those decisions are going to impact our future. So we need to make sure that our, that the people reading these books are um, going, going to be like well-rounded people and yeah. Great, really well said, Joni, thank you so much. I'm gonna stop sharing. So we get the whole panel back on the screen here. Um, I'm, I want to throw this open to Karuna and Emily and Abby. If you have titles that you have read or know about that you think are important that people be given access to. Okay. Oh, okay. I could unmute myself easily. Um, one of the books that I've read recently, it was also um, like, the Hate You Give was also required reading um, in my junior year. Um, and I read Between the World and Bee by Tony Hussey Coates. And I just have to say, one, it's an incredibly well-written book just to analyze the literature in itself. It's like an amazing experience and I wouldn't want that to be robbed of anyone. But two, I think that um, Coates does it like an amazing job at like kind of like what you're talking about with the mirrors, Miranda. Like, just as um, Windows, the window that I had with that book was just amazing. I learned a lot. I think everyone in my class like came out with it, learning a lot. We had amazing group discussions in that um, um, in that class. And I think like even if you didn't agree with it, I think the experiences experiences he talks about and the way that he writes them, it's such a like evocative, like he writes very much with his emotions and just really retells his life and 
he talks to his son in this book um, about the experiences that he is warning his son of and like, um, and yeah, it, it's a very emotional book and I just felt like I learned so much and grasped this whole new world that I didn't even realize existed. And I think it's just an important work, um, book that people like read so that they can grasp more and learn more and to rob people of that opportunity to learn. And I think it's a shame. It's a very good book. Yeah, um, I definitely agree with what Joni and Karuna have said. I've read both The Hate You Give and um, Between the World and Me, and I think both of them were really eye-opening books for me. I think it was the first, The Hate You Give I read first. It was one of the first pieces of literature I read where I really saw the author talking about experiences that I had gone through with race and being a teenager in school um, and dealing with sort of all of that combined, especially as Star enters a predominantly white school and has to sort of balance like her home life where she's in a much different environment with her school life. And I think it's just something that's really relatable to a lot of students. Um, and same with, like Karina said about Between the World and Me, I think it's just like such a wonderful piece of literature and sort of talked about race in a way that I had never been able to articulate before, but I think they articulate it very well. Um, another book that I read recently is called The Kite Runner. Um, I don't remember the author, but The Kite Runner, and I think another book that the same that was written by the same author, they talk about um, experiences of uh, teenagers living in the Middle East and dealing with sort of a lot of the um, humanitarian crises. Um, and it's, I think it, they were mostly controversial like a couple of years ago. Um, but again, this was a time where I had never sort of read anything like it or any story similar to it. And I think especially, I'm blanking on the name of the title, but The Kite Runner, um, The Kite Runner in particular, um, I think really opened my eyes to the experiences um, of people and I know that of other of other people who live in different areas and have sort of facing different conflicts but at the same time I could relate to a lot of what they were saying and I think this was a really great example of like a window um, where I'm still able to relate to the character and sort of the internal struggles that they're going through but obviously like the external struggles that they're going through are very different um, and I think it's sort of a perspective that American students aren't exposed to very often um, with children and teenagers living in the Middle East and dealing with all of the violence, um, a lot of which has been caused by American colonialism um, and sort of, yeah, I mean, like a whole bunch of different things, um, again, largely caused by the American government and military. Um, but I, yeah, I'd say it was a really eye-opening book. And I, again, like the literature was amazing and very well written. Um, and it truly, like both of those books, I would say are probably in my top 10 all time favorite reads um, just because they expose me to such great stories. Um, yeah. I really like picture books. And so some of the ones that I've picked out recently, I think it's fascinating to look through that list and I will typically pull it up just to see if there are new ones being challenged that maybe I haven't read because I think it's important to do so many of these I've read but you look back on the list and you've got the Harry Potter series and you've got you know Catcher in the Rye and Kill a Mockingbird and Brave New World all the ones that really kind of propelled my high school time to kind of think outside the box but as I become a parent and I spend a lot of time in elementary schools, I enjoy seeing things that we can use to start conversations at a younger age. And so two that I found this year that I really love is it feels good to be yourself. And then my shadow is pink and Scott Stewart writes a whole series of really beautiful books that are very simple, but they give verbiage to kids and, um, I think sometimes we think about the band books like hi, and the comments I get from parents often are here at the kinder first and second grade where the fear really starts to take traction. And um, I was the PTO president at River Grove when OBOB happened and George, now Melissa, was a part. And while it wasn't officially challenged, it was, we ended up having a whole special PTO meeting just about that book. And it was very interesting and very informative and 
most of the people that came in opposing it had not read it and honestly probably didn't end up reading it, but we had an opportunity to give some very factual pieces to their fear. And I think facts versus fear kind of shut some of that down. So these picture books kind of start these conversations at the base level and anything Scott Stewart has done has been lovely to have. So I get really excited when I see them in libraries. Great data. Either of the librarians want to add anything about challenges to picture books or that topic? I'm putting you on the spot. It's okay. I'm I'm happy to jump in. I that sort of triggered for me something that um, what Miranda said about how challenges you know can come from all different angles and all different positions. And over the 26 years that I've been a children's librarian in a public library setting, I have had conversations with parents who don't want their kid reading Junie B. Jones because Junie B. Go Jones doesn't have very good manners or they don't want them reading um, Harry Potter was an example or um, just recently I heard somebody complaining about Peppa Pig because Peppa Pig jumps in every puddle she gets comes along and some parents don't like that and so I think it is interesting to keep in mind that um, sometimes challenges come from very different perspectives but what we're seeing now is a much more concerted effort and a very very tight focus on race and lgbtq plus uh, authors and topics and experiences um, and that really does feel um, it, it's very concerning and something that we have to continue to stand up against and and in as far as picture books go um it has been an absolute delight to build a collection at our public library in which we have picture books that um, open windows, doors, sliding glass doors, mirrors, you know, for all of the children that use our collection, because we do, um, I know personally children who have transitioned while, you know, in the years I've been there. And it's so heartwarming to know that they can come into the library and see a book that reflects who they are and, and you know, what they believe. And, that is such an important role that the public library plays. Abby, thank you for bringing up picture books because um, they are really important and we've we've worked really hard to diversify and, and add to our, our collections at the elementary schools and we've had um, specially set aside money from the school district to do that and so we're proud of our efforts there and received some grants and um, yeah, it's I think I think I hope you're seeing when you're visiting our schools more um, selection. I would add, I think you can see it in what the kids bring home or how they're able to use that in classroom conversations. And again, if we can start young with taking out fear from things that feel really controversial, I feel will encourage a generation that can have these conversations rather than signing a petition or a protest. Hopefully. So I have been very impressed with all of the additions, especially for picture books. It's been fantastic. Great. Um, before we move on, I want to say how impressed I am that the high school students in the Lake Oswego School District are reading Angie Thomas and Ta-Nehisi Coates. And I guess some of the younger students are reading Ibram Kendi and that form. And that's you students are so lucky. And I, I hope you appreciate that. And I'm really glad that the, the curriculum includes those books. Uh, Abby's last comment um, before we started talking more about picture books leads to um, my next question, which is how are schools and libraries preparing for or responding to or dealing with these challenges and controversies? Um, I can weigh in on that as far as school libraries, certainly, um, especially since I help support um, districts throughout Oregon um, who are facing challenges or preparing for challenges because I think, especially at this time, we all have to be ready. Um, and a lot of that involves looking at policies, making sure our policies are up to date because the best way to deal with a book challenge is to say, here's the form, 
to fill out. Here's the process. Here's what happens next. Now we form a committee. Now we all read the book. Now we have that discussion. Um, here's who makes the decision. And to have that laid out so that there's no chance that someone would just say, okay, now we're pulling this book without going through the process correctly. So having those policies in place and training staff. So often it's not, I'm not the one that hears first that there's an issue, um, making sure everybody in a school in the libraries, but throughout the school knows that we don't just take books off the shelf. We have a process that we go through. So that's just being prepared, having the policies, having the process ready to go. And then educating people, students and, and staff and everyone about the concept of intellectual freedom and the rights that students have to have the freedom to read, even in a school. Thanks, Brenda. That, um very similarly in the public library setting, it's so important to be prepared and educated and ready for a challenge that might come. And I think that what is important for, for a lot of us to understand is that there's, there's, there's challenges and there are formal requests for reconsideration, which may then lead to what Miranda just described, forming the committee, everybody reads the book, a decision is made. But what happens at the public library, at least in my experience most often, is that our staff who are well-versed in the controversy and the issues have the opportunity to talk with an individual about intellectual freedom, about the right of everybody to read what they want to read when they want to read it, and to listen to that, that person, whatever their complaint is, um, and hopefully have the outcome be that that person understands, okay, maybe that book needs to stay on the shelf for somebody else, but I don't have to read it. And if in fact they do want to make a formal request for reconsideration, that you have you know, your policies to back you up, but you also have a well-educated a well and supportive library advisory board and council. Um, and you know, going back to the issue that, that Chris brought up about um, transgender, you know, with, with the very close proximity of that challenge, um, you know, we as library staff made sure that everybody who might encounter a challenge about that book um, knew the issues and were ready ready to answer the questions when they come. I'm a, Go ahead. My name is Jackie Seward Shade and I'm a retired librarian and I've served on the advisory council for the library for a number of years. About two years ago, the council took a real strong look at the request to remove material form that we had and approved an updated version of it. It is very strong. I don't believe there was anybody then and certainly not now on the council who didn't support the um, this particular request that a person has to fill out. Uh, the, the advisory board is very strongly behind what's going on at the library. And the community ought to know that. And the most important question on that form, quite frankly, is have you read this book? Mm -hmm. And I've heard now several of you talking about people who come with complaints about books that they haven't even read. And quite frankly, that's, um, first of all, it's a no brainer of a question for people. But it's, it's, it's really frustrating to me that libraries and librarians and students who want to read what they want to read are being attacked because people don't have any tolerance. Um, but we have a really wonderful form in place in Lake Oswego Public Library that is very should be very helpful to support the librarians and to to support Melissa who sometimes has to talk to these these people um, and she does a brilliant job um, so thank you 
rest assured that 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 form is in place. And I think it's good to point out too that most of the time people just want to have a conversation about why you had that book. It's very rare, very rare that they actually want to move forward with a formal challenge. And so, you know, listening and making sure they understand how we select books and that as librarians, we're not just buying whatever for, you know, we have a process, we read reviews, we, you know, do do some work to select books um, and to make sure they are, are right for our library and our, our patrons um, is, is really important. Thank you. Um, Abby, I'm curious if you have thoughts about how parents in the, in schools can best support um, librarians and teachers in, in, in uh, supporting the freedom to read? Um, I think there's a couple things that you can do. I think the first thing is if you notice that your child has a teacher that is engaging in some of these books that are windows and mirrors to go out of your way to say thank you. As a parent who has been in two separate parent communities now, I feel that they get a lot of the other side, even if people aren't wanting the book removed, they have an opposition against it for one reason or another. So feeling supported as a teacher is very important. I think the other thing is the same thing goes for your librarian. I go out of my way to comment on the display or books that my kid brought home and to make sure that they hear our support. And then the third thing I think you can do is to reach out to your teachers because I think what people forget is so many things, not just books, but so many things in a classroom from the borders to the Play-Doh, there are many things teachers purchase with their own money. And that goes for their classroom libraries oftentimes. And so we have reached out over the past couple of years, just my family and a couple other families and said, will you give us a list? And then we've bought them. And we feel that they are the best informed. We know that they are working with the librarians to make sure they are books that are on that list, but to have extra copies of it in a classroom library setting is very important. Um, I know that when OBOB was happening, George was checked out. Some people maybe checked it out longer for whatever reason. So we as a family unit and a couple other families purchased a mass quantity of them to be available in classroom libraries. And so I think that you can put your money where your beliefs are pretty fast with that, and then they stay behind. So those are some areas that I think are really important. Also, if you're engaging in reading banned books or books that are controversial and you hear about it on Facebook, reading it and educating yourself and putting yourself squarely in a position to have that conversation really, again, facts versus fear shuts it down. We saw that with the health curriculum. I think we're going to see the need for parents to just be on the playground willing to have a conversation about that more than we've needed in the past. Great. Thank you, Abby. Uh, so a last question before we go into breakout rooms, and this is also going to be the question to be discussed in the breakout rooms. Um, and I hope you all have some thoughts to share about this. But uh, so much of, of these controversies is um, framed as banning of books or challenging of books. And I like to think of it in the opposite side, which is the freedom to read, like the civil liberty that's at stake. And I'm curious, especially students, you may not have thought about it as the freedom to read before tonight, but based on this discussion that we've had so far, how would you define the freedom to read and, and why is it Im important? And students, I'm putting you on the spot. If you don't have thoughts about it, I'm sure the librarians will or will jump in and rescue you. So I can go. Um, I think, you know, reading is one of the best ways to get information, right? When I was little, I would check out, like, my mom still talks about how I don't do this anymore, and she's very devastated. But I used to check out, like, 60 books from the library a week and just read. Um, and the amount of stories and experiences that I was able to gain without actually having to, you know, live through them um, was insane. It was crazy. Um, and I was able to learn so much about different people, even though I, at the time I went to a very, very small private school and everybody sort of had the same experiences through reading and through learning about other people's stories. I think I was able to develop a lot of empathy and just a lot of like 
sort of knowledge that I think maybe we don't talk about as often. It's not really like, oh, I can solve a math problem. Um, but it was sort of like I, I gained the experience and knowledge um, and the emotions from different characters and different authors. Um, and so when I was exposed to different people, you know, after sort of, although Lake House Week is still pretty small, but as I meet different people with different experiences, I'm able to relate to them. And I think since it's not the first time that I might have heard someone's story. So for example, I read Melissa when I was pretty young, I think maybe around when it first came out. Um, I read Melissa. And so that was before I had ever met anyone who's transgender. Um, but then when I met someone who's transgender, I wasn't sort of shocked by their, I guess, existence. Um, and I was able to sort of be on a different level of understanding. Um, and I think as I discover, as I explore my own gender identity, I also look back at that. And I think it was just a really great way, not only for me to develop more understanding for myself, but also better understanding of other people. Yeah, I definitely agree with that, especially like what you were talking about the last, um, last bit, like um, for like the freedom to read, you know, I think a lot of times people think that if we're never exposed to something like that, like especially when it comes to like LGBTQ books, you know, you think that they think that if, you know, if no one ever reads these gay books, no one's ever going to be gay or trans, but <laughs> it's not like that, you know, you can't choose. And I think in a lot of these communities, especially where these books are being banned, it's already isolating enough being you know, a queer person and um, to have these books and to be able to feel that you're not alone or to like get a sort of semblance of idea of like, you know, there's other people out there like you or, you know, just to kind of get a grasp on your identity to like, figure out your place in the world and to have other people be able to know that kind of like what Emily was saying and, you know, just to understand. And I think it's like the freedom to read um, is just a way to, I guess, grasp at the world I feel like you know it's yeah I think it's just so important for people to be able to see themselves to not feel alone and especially in groups like the like you know when people try to censor um queer books um you know queer kids especially already are at a higher rate of suicide higher rate of depression um so many things like that and I just think it's so important for people to be able to see themselves and feel seen Kind of adding on to Karuna, um, that this is going to be hard to top because um, what Emily and Karuna said are was like amazing. But um, I think, yeah, kind of adding on to Karuna's when, well, we know that books are being banned under the intent of like perpetuating certain religious beliefs or political beliefs, um, kind of. And these are being said under like the shield of a concerned parent, but these um, like when these beliefs are being forced onto others, I feel like it's kind of not only a danger to our democracy, but also to progression in our society. Um, you know, we're moving forward, we're, you know, doing great, but um, when people try to censor these, I feel like we're just moving backwards and um we we might not fit into the category of these stories that are like being told like it might not be our story but we can learn so much about other people's stories and kind of like how Emily was talking about when she was younger she would borrow like a ton of books and read about other people's stories and that would give her a lot of insight um that's also what I did and um yeah, I think those books that I read when I was younger and still am now have definitely like shaped me to be more of an insightful person um, and uh, someone with more empathy. Wow, that was so well put by all three of you. Thank you. It's very moving. Um, so we're going to go to breakout rooms now and you're your facilitators will guide you, but your number one topic is, is how do you conceive of the freedom to read? Uh, why, wh what are its dimensions? Why is it important? And if you, if you exhaust that topic or start circling, you can also talk about specific books that you feel are 
um, that you've read that are, you know, are controversial and why you think they are important, why it was important that you were able to read that particular book. Um, and let's see. Yeah, so the questions are, have you read a book that has been challenged or banned? Why do you think it's important that people be able to read that book? That's the second question. The first one is, given the panel's comments on the freedom to read and all the foregoing discussion, why do you think it is important? Okay. Any, any other comments before we go into breakout rooms? I think Trina is gonna send you into the breakout rooms for 20 minutes. And when you come back, each group is gonna present one salient point or question. And we have a book giveaway. And we have, a, sorry, yes, we have a book giveaway when you come back to. Emily, hi, everybody, welcome back. Hi, Chuck. Hawaii or something, where are you? Well, yeah. Yeah, hello. Aloha. Welcome back, everybody. I hope you had a good discussion. And what we'd like to do is a quick once around the breakout rooms, of which I think there were eight, if we don't count the discussion, the panel members. And if one person, maybe the facilitator or another designee, uh, would just share one kind of salient point or interesting observation or important question that came out of your discussion. So the panelists were room one. So can we have anybody from room two? And I'm looking for use your raising hand. If you use your raised hand reaction thingy. <clears throat> I don't see anybody. Let's see. Anybody from room two? I don't remember which room I was. Which oh, okay. Room I was yeah. <clears throat> right. So then, why don't we just go? Uh, whenever someone from a particular room, Connie, are you ready to share something? Sure, sure. Um, we had a great discussion, um, and to, to address the well, actually both of them, but I love this quote from one of our members: "The right to read is the right to explore the world." and gives us a better understanding what, of what's around us. And I think that's, that's we talked a lot about that. Another one was, if, if we aren't allowed to read all these wonderful books, we'll become a nation of idiots. <laughs> <laughs> I really like that one. And then, and then just another one is, a lot of these books have to do with the history of, of racism, history of, um, and history of a lot of, of different groups. And it's important that we bring all this to light. And if we don't, if we just shut off all this, we just keep stepping backwards. So those are important things that came out of our discussion. Great, thank you. I see Jan Stanley has yes. raised her hand. Thank you. Um, we had a wonderful conversation and the, the, the big statement that we thought we would bring back to the group is one from one of the panelists uh, that everybody was just loved that when Karuna talked about taking those books away isolates the very people that need them. And these books help us figure out our place in the world. Um, we had a great discussion around that. thought that was a wonderful, wonderful insight. All three of those high school panelists, by the way, made me cry. They're just phenomenal phenomenal so articulate and aware of the world we just loved it um a, another point that was brought up which i thought was really cool was a connection between freedom that's closely intertwined between book banning and also travel the freedom to travel because there's a big connection there the freedom to travel in your mind um the freedom to literally travel and um we all love the different framing of the issue of book banning instead of banning books it's let's talk about having the freedom to read that that was really a, a great turnaround on that perspective 
that that we that we all have this freedom to read, and that should not be taken away. There you go. Thank you. Uh, let's stay with the Jan theme, and I see Jan C also has her hand up. Unmute myself. Yes, uh, we had a delightful group and a delightful discussion. Um, and we thought our statement would be the fact that uh, the freedom to read increases our um, our perspective, our empathy. It makes the world better. It helps us with critical thinking. And in making the world a better place for others, we make the world a better place for ourselves. Did I forget anything, everybody? <laughs> we get it? That's pretty great. Thank you. Um, Pat, I see Pat has your hand, you have your hand up. Yes, I think um, our group also um, really did appreciate what all the panelists have to say. Um, we're very appreciative of what the students said and reflective of pretty much the same themes um, and how some of the books had students um, really learning to love school again and talked about like the hope for a future um, as you learn about other countries and from through books, you know, you learn about real life problems. And if you didn't read books, I mean, how would you be aware of what's going on in other countries? Um, and then also around what Karuna had said about um, sometimes if you're feeling isolated, the books have really helped um, people like see themselves and how other people have lived and really about learning about tolerance and empathy as well. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Edward. See you. Have your hand up. Uh, You're muted, Ed. Okay. Am I on now? Yes. Okay. Well, we had a similar one to uh, to Jan. We said the people who are banning books are the people that should read them <laughs> most. They're the most needy. But the thing that we talked a lot about is, given the, the panel's comments on freedom to read, why do we think it's important? We feel, felt really strongly it's important because it is a cornerstone of democracy. In order to have a dem democracy, we must have the freedom to read. And people who are now attacking our books and our literature are trying to, in, in essence, destroy our democracy. And we have to fight that because that is a right we all have to read what it is we want and to read all, all the ideas and to not have our minds controlled by an autocratic system. So I think that was, our, our result was really, it's, it's key to a democracy. We have to have a freedom to read. Great, thank you. Um, I see two more, Sarah. Oh, three more, Sarah. Okay, um, I was um, a facilitator in a breakout room and there were a lot of really valuable things said that I think haven't been mentioned before. Um, and some of them were actually questions. So um, we actually had a question for the librarians. Um, how have you handled inappropriately aged books? Like when you see someone who you think might be too young checking out a book that might alter or be considered inappropriate um, for their age, where does that guidance for the age guidelines begin? Where does it stop? Um, how do we, where does freedom meet its limitations, I guess? And then we also talked about how to discuss opposing views. So like when you sit down and you talk about a book with someone and they have a completely different view than you do, how do you handle that? How do you approach it? And then one of my, um, one of the things that a lot of us agreed on was we need to let people read so they can form their own opinions, so they could be their own person. Because if we don't, then it just closes up the world so much. But yeah, I think the main thing was like the limitations of what we read and who reads it. And is reading certain things too young going to alter somebody's views in the future? Uh, like topics 
books that have a positive stance on things that are not positive, like racism and anti-Semitism. Um, how do we, where do we draw the line? Where does, you know? Yeah. And we're gonna, <clears throat> that's a great question. And that's gonna be the first question in the Q and A session, section, which is next. But I wanna finish up with our report outs from the breakout rooms. We've got two more, Kathy Lloyd. Thank you. Our group talked about the, uh, first of all, thanking our elected officials, our librarians, our staff members who are so dedicated to ensuring our freedom to read and things that our elected officials and our staff members do each day in and out to ensure our freedom to read. And we also talked about uh, using our power of freedom to read uh, and our ability to use that power to have discussions with other people, to open windows and doors for ourselves. And so we, we had a good discussion about ways in which we use our freedom to read um, to in powerful ways. Great, thank you. And I think the last group is Annie. Thank you, Chris. We had a lovely group conversation. Um, salient points included fear as the underlying river of the movement to ban um, and the irony that banning only increases kids' interest in reading banned books. So not a very effective strategy. Um, and then the other pieces were um, similar to other conversations folks have had, um, being able to read as a way of increasing knowledge, um, increasing one's perspective, um, a sense of acceptance and connectedness with others, um, and making the world a better place. If I missed anything, if anyone in my group wants to chime in in the chat, please do. Thank you so much. Thank you, <clears throat> facilitators. And those are lots of great insights from our breakout rooms. We're going to transition now to Q&A. And uh, people are already putting some questions in the chat, which is great. You can um, chat directly to me, or you can chat with the whole group, and we'll, I'll um, pull the questions out of that. But we're going to start with that first question, which was from Sarah's breakout room uh, for the librarians. And Sarah, you can cut in here if you want, but it's a kind of a gloss. Um, wh where, if anywhere, is there a line about um, putting some limits on the freedom to read for very young um, readers? And, uh, you know, if are there some topics or ideas that some readers might be too young to really digest and how do librarians and parents navigate that? I can address that a little bit. I think schools and public libraries have some differences um, in terms of how much parents are there supervising what students check out, their, their child checks out to read. Um, but I will say, for the most part, you know, we, I, I noticed that when a student borrows something that's maybe more mature than they're ready for, um, they're pretty quick to come to me or to someone else and say, hey, I'm not sure I like this book. Um, I get this a lot in middle school. There's, there's romance and kissing in it. And I don't, I don't like that. And so, you know, we can say, oh, I'm so glad that you know what you're ready for and want to read. And um, let's find some books with no kissing that you'll like, right? So, so I, I really think young people are good at <laughs> deciding what they're ready to read and, you know, we'll put down books often that they're not ready for. In school libraries, of course, you know, we have books that are appropriate for high school in the high school library. And, um, but of course, a kindergartner is very different from a fifth grader in the same school. And so certainly we try to help guide them towards the things that are appropriate for their age, their reading level, their interests, whatever it is. But, you know, every every student is different as far as what they're they're ready for. Um, so I don't know if that completely answers the question. But 
definitely providing some guidance and making sure our collection is serves a, a lot of different needs um, and also helping students understand that they don't have to read anything. If they're reading something and it's, they're not understanding it or they're bothered by it, um, they absolutely don't have to keep reading that book and we can help them find something they'll like. Andrea or Abby, did you want to add anything to that? Um, I'd be I'd be happy to add, um, in addition to children and young people having a really good concept of when they're up against something that they might not understand or that they don't like, I often talk with parents about the fact that children have the ability to, if they don't have the capacity to understand something they're reading about, they sort of gloss over it, that it's, you know, if there's something that comes up that they have no experience with, um, and I have some funny stories, you know, over the years of, of that happening, um, you know, a, a, a student or a young person thinking that people were in the, the drugstore buying condiments when they were actually buying condoms, but they didn't know what condoms were. So they're like, oh, they were buying condiments. You know, like those kinds of things that are that you can talk to parents about and reassure them that if their child comes up against something that they don't aren't ready for, that, that they're not gonna have the capacity to understand that. And then I think what's really important here is talking about, this is the value added of having a librarian. You know, this is not Amazon, this is not, you know, some random book out of a bookstore online, but you have a you have a live person to talk to um, who can help guide that child to the right book for the right time for the right moment. Yeah, and I would add, I think it's interesting that oftentimes parents feel if their kid is exposed to something and then they come home and want to talk about it, that it is going to open Pandora's box. And I like to encourage parents to remember that every conversation is a really important moment of connection. And so if your child does read something that they don't understand, if they're willing to come home and talk to you about it, what a beautiful moment to tell them I'm safe, I'm here. I am happy to process this with you. That seemed confusing. Let's go ahead and talk about it. Um, and then the other piece I would add is Having, I think a lot of parents forget that the way our librarians circulate in those spaces, being a substitute teacher has been such a beautiful gift to be able to see all of our librarians in their natural spaces. And they aren't just standing behind waiting to check out. They are engaging with what's in a child's hand. They're making suggestions. They are saying, if you loved this, you might also like this. Um, when a child does quickly put a book down or say, I didn't understand that, or that seemed you know, too big, they'll quickly redirect them. And so I think we've lost a little bit of trust in the people that this is what they do and they do it so well. And so I try to remind parents that that is a very unique experience too, that our kids get to have at the library. Um, and then the other thing I'd say, so my second grader picked up new kid and brought it home and it was already halfway read before I even realized what she had. <clears throat> and she picked out the pieces that, she, <clears throat> excuse me, that she understood. And then the rest of it just kind of went over here. And we so often discount our kids' ability to pull out those pieces, again, those mirrors that maybe reflect something that they can relate to, and then tuck the other pieces away. So <clears throat> give your kids a chance. Thank you. Here's a question from um, Jan. Regarding the process for determining whether a book should be banned or not, how is the local committee formed and who actually makes the final decision? Um, I can I can read you what is literally written in that wonderful materials collection policy that Jackie was referring to earlier. Um, what happens in the public library system is that if a patron submits a formal request for reconsideration and the document you know, they have to say that they've read the book, they have to pull out the pieces that they are challenging. Um, that, let's see. Then, oh, so then the item is reviewed according to, you know, up against our materials collection policy. We look at the reviews that were written, um, the selector will be pulled in. Um, then the then it goes to our library advisory board, 
they can be it can be appealed to the library advisory board. Um, they will review the appeal and make a recommendation to the library director for the final decision. So in that case, it's not a committee of um, you know extra sort of curricular members of the community, but it is the library advisory board on the advice of the selector and the materials collection policy. And ours is very similar in that we get together a committee, we read the book, we talk about it um, and make recommendation um, and the school board makes the final decision um, on, on that book. I think this is the last question that I've seen in the chat. Um, it, this is from Rick. Isn't the freedom of speech a right? Isn't the freedom to read included under that right that all Americans have? Isn't banning books unconstitutional? Anyone want to take a swing at that? Did any of you students take con law or participate in the con law team? So I'll just I'll just say that yes, it is, and students have a right to free speech and to the freedom to read. I mean, that's not under eighteen doesn't mean you you lost that that right. Um, when a book is banned, um, we can challenge that. Right now in um, uh, Medford, um, they banned The Handmaid's Tale, a graphic novel, and we are looking for students who are would be willing to be part of a lawsuit to say, hey, this is impinging on my rights. And so um, around the country, you know, the ACLU and other groups are finding student defendants who will appeal that and, and try to get those decisions overturned. Um, uh, so there are lots of people fighting that. I would add as the son of an attorney, <laughs> there's a somewhat fine legal point here, which is that um, what's that uh, libraries and, and schools make decisions all the time about what books they're going to include or not include in the curriculum. And that's a matter of judgment and, and what's what the goals and objectives of the library's collection are or the curriculum. What's truly unconstitutional is preventing a book from being published and distributed. And in fact, there was just a case last week in Virginia where a Republican lawmaker tried to get both Gender Queer and a book by Sarah Moss, A Court of Mist and Fire, declared obscene so that it could not be sold in bookstores or otherwise distributed in the entire state of Virginia. And a U.S. Uh, judge, I, in my opinion, rightly uh, <laughs> ruled that that was truly unconstitutional and a violation of the First Amendment, uh, what's it called a prior restraint. So there's that piece, um, but I also believe that there is a freedom to read embedded in the, the First Amendment and you should be able to read about what you wanna read. Um, let's see if there's any more questions. Well, here's a clarification on Sarah's question, thanks. Mulaney. I wonder if only part of Sarah's question got answered. It's one thing to help kids make sense of good faith, but not understandable portrayals of romance. I wonder if Sarah was also asking how we support children and adults who are encountering material that is violent or hateful. Are political groups pushing to add or require libraries or curricula to include books from the point of view of, say, gay conversion therapy or white supremacy? What strategies do librarians and communities have for those situations? Whew. <laughs> I have not personally read about or seen, and that doesn't mean it hasn't happened, um, groups pushing pushing to require or include books with those point of views. Um, so I'm not sure I can answer that part. Um, we, you know, we have a, a review process and, a, and an approval process for the, the curriculum, anything invited included in the curriculum. And so um, I imagine if that happened, we would, uh, you know, reject that suggestion. <laughs> it's um, teachers and administrators in the district who select the curriculum and then um, the community has a chance to comment on it. So it usually doesn't happen the other way around that the community suggests materials to include in the curriculum. So. Um, 
Um, I don't know if Sarah, if you want to jump back on air and clarify your question or try to restate it. Yeah, real quick. I believe her name is pronounced Sara. Just. I'm sorry, Sara. Thank you, Emily. Um, and uh, thank you, Chris, for respecting that. Um, a lot of people don't, unfortunately. But um, yeah, I actually am kind of curious about that because I do feel like, especially in the climate we live in, I do agree with um, the person who put that in. What were, um, what are the protocols for that? Like, what if there is actually hate speech in a book? Because I, I know that books are written like that. And I know that I was personally uncomfortable when reading books like To Kill a Mockingbird. Um, and obviously, very, very good um, message behind it. But the narration or the way it's told is kind of outdated. And I know a lot of people agree with me on that, but I don't think it should be banned. I'm just wondering what you think when there is direct hate speech in books that are required for people. Yeah, I hope that makes sense. <laughs> Sorry, it does. It does make sense. And it's a very um, complex and complicated issue um, handled a little differently in schools than in public libraries. Um, we as a public library are committed to providing materials for the interests of all of our patrons um, but we at the same time make sure that if there are particularly i will say in the children's collection because there's there's a difference between an adult reading a book and having the ability to recognize hate speech or recognize um an out of date stereotypical portrayal of you know a particular culture or person um, but for a child where you can't necessarily guarantee that they will be reading that book in concert with an adult who can help explain the out of date nature of it or the political climate in which a book might have been written um, we take very seriously the overall nature of our collection and over the last two years have actually audited both our young adult collection as well as our juvenile fiction collection in order to identify items that probably shouldn't be on our shelves anymore for one reason or another. Um, that said, there are still books on our shelves that some people will find controversial and difficult to read. Um, every time I have a an adult looking for Little House on the Prairie to read with their child, grandchild, niece, nephew, I take that as an opportunity to say to them, first of all, there are so many other newer books that are so much more um, appropriate and enjoyable and try these and these and these. And if you're going to read Little House on the Prairie, make sure you talk about the portrayal of Native Americans and Indigenous people. And so, um, it's a really, it's a really good question, and um, something that that libraries throughout Oregon have been have been struggling to address. I will say over the last two and three years, in particular. I'd also like to add, sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. No, please, Karuna. Um, but um, we read The Great Gatsby in my English class last year, and we did have a long discussion in class about um, the different racial portrayals and the way that. Um, the women are portrayed in the book. And I think that it was really important. I think it's it's a really well-written book, but I think that without having the discussions throughout the book while reading it about um, what these moments mean and like um, just kind of discussing like the racial undertones and to have them stated instead of rather ignored, I think that like um, really made a difference. Kind of like um, what was being said earlier, just that acknowledging the fact that these characters are betrayed in a manner that isn't good is um, really important. And I think that it can really lend to a discussion about those books in a way that isn't just banning them and saying, no one should ever read these books. It, it, isn't, that, isn't that the beauty of reading? That you read something, it makes you uncomfortable but you're in a safe enough position where you can have guidance through when the book was written, why it was written the way it was, and brings you into 
thinking, heaven forbid, let's think for a change, think our way through some of these difficult topics with guidance. Um, I think that's the beauty of reading for all of us. It's not just for teenagers, it's for adults and for people of my age as well. You approach a book that is new to you or a subject that's new to you and it forces you to think. I can't believe that there's something wrong with thinking, especially, <laughs> guided, especially guided thinking in, in a high school situation, for instance, or uh, grandma reading about uh, Pa's being in blackface. Um, there are so many wonderful books out there that need to be put in perspective because of when they were written that still have so much goodness in them. Um, and it seems to me that if we are uh, put in a position of actually having to think through something, we get so much stronger in our own uh, ability to cope with the world. Great, that's a great point, Jackie. And Sara, thank you for coming back on and uh, clarifying your question and sorry about your name. Um, we are going to do a quick call to action that I think Andrea maybe is gonna lead that piece or I'm not sure who's presenting those, the call to action. Um, and then Abby is going to engineer our great book giveaway. We're gonna give away eight frequently challenged, sometimes banned books with which if you're the winner, you can celebrate your freedom to read. <clears throat> I think based on the look on Andrea's face, maybe we the presenters need a little guidance from the, maybe from Don or Trina about how we're gonna present the call to action. My assumption was that it was gonna show up as a poll. Is that not the case? Maybe not, or a slide. Give, give us your list, Andrea. We'll uh, populate the chat and then put up a poll. I sent the list. Okay, it's a long list. Yes. You want me to read it out? You want to? Oh, it's already That's... in the chat now. Yeah. Oh, it's okay. in the chat. Oh, look, yeah. it happened magically. Yes. <laughs> Nicely Thank done, you. Emily. I was waiting for some sort of cue. But... <laughs> Nicely done, Emily. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. <clears throat> we'll give you a couple minutes to read through those. Mostly, I just want to say, come to the library and check out a book. Great list. Thank you so much. Okay, Abby, are you ready for the book giveaway? Okay, we're gonna do a random number generator. So in the chat, I'm gonna click a button, put a number between one and 100, and I'm gonna spin the wheel. I'm going to wait and only put it in if you would like one of the books because you might not be in a position to read a new book right now or have a very long list like I do. Excellent. Okay, the first number that I rolled was 89. So I'm looking. Who is the closest to 89? Rick is 77. All right, Rick. You can keep your numbers in there. I'm going to roll it again. Hold on. Seventy-three. So Rick, you would have won a second time. Hold on. There's somebody Wait, on the number I seventy-three. Seventy-three. In. Who said seventy-three? I did, Emily. <laughs> Emily. Emily, nice. All right, I'm gonna roll again. I have seven. The number seven. Didn't someone get number seven? Oh, there's a person with. There's an eight. And there's, a there's an eight. Ooh. Oh. 
So Sherry, you guys are very close. And Jane. 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 Okay. You guys are such good sports. Hold on. 16. Do I have anyone close to six? Oh, 13. Connie. There's 18, Esther. Oh, Esther. Okay. And 30. Wasn't there a 33? 27. Ooh, who's 27? Jan? Jan. Yay. Jan. <laughs> and there's a 28, too. Oh, who's 28? It's me, Karuna. All right. Yay. Those are our eight books, and we are going to have them at the public library, correct? I will send the names over so you guys have them for afterwards, but thank you guys for playing. Um, do we I'm have sorry. the names of the books? Oh, good question. Do we have the names of the books? Mm -hmm. We have two copies of Beloved by Toni Morrison. We have the bluest, the bluest Eye by Toni Morrison, Fun Home, a Family <laughs> Tragic Comic by Alison Bechdel, Stamped from the Beginning by Ibram X. Kendi, Looking for Alaska by John Green, The Perks of Being a Wallflower by Stephen Chomsky, and Speak by Laurie Hulse Anderson. So we'll put all of those books um, at the circulation desk at the library, and we'll have a list stop by whenever you have a chance to pick up your free book. Is it just like first Very come, they just pick the one that they want if they get there first? Or that seems uh, like a good idea to me. Oof, okay, we open, open at 10 a.m. tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> I'll skip school, I'll be there. Oh, <laughs> uh, that's funny. Okay, um, just to clarify, this edition of stamped i bought these books at uh, annie bloom's uh, independent bookstore this morning but this edition of stamped is the original adult version and then fun home is actually right behind miranda in her backdrop that's pretty i like that and now i'm turning it over to pat but at first i want to thank especially the student panelists for sharing their uh thoughts and um eloquence with us it's great to meet all of you and hear you, uh, but thank you to all of our panelists. Thank you so much. We were very super so impressed by all of your insights and perspectives. And um, we as adults certainly know that, you know, the future and our democracy is in good hands with youth like you who are stepping up today. So thank you very much. At least we can exhale for that in this moment in time. <laughs> um, and Sarah's going to join me after we do our quick poll. The poll is should be an easy poll tonight in support of the students and their panel. Can you commit to any of the actions that were proposed tonight? The poll disappeared from my screen too quick for me to answer. Uh oh, it's still on. Oh, what happened? That happened to mine too. It said I voted too late for it to I'm be. Sorry, gone. I think I might have accidentally killed it. Sorry, this is Chris. Uh, can the person who owns the poll relaunch it? I'm so sorry, I hit the wrong button. There we go. Sorry. Okay. Who co hosted Chris? I know. Yeah, exactly. Take away my co host privileges right now. <laughs> okay. I'm going to say it again. So, can you commit to any of the proposed actions tonight? And if you can't remember what they are, we'll be sending out an email as a reminder with the actions as well. So, thank you. I'm so surprised about all the books that are on the list, um, even like 
that were even kind of mentioned at the end. Um, but what really? So I'm really interested, and in, we'll also send out you know the the links. Um, I know some people in my group are also interested in that whole list of challenge books. Okay, so did most people vote get a chance to vote? I'm sorry, if you are co-host, I don't think you get a chance to vote, so. Yep, everybody that could okay. vote did vote. Okay, thank you. Um, so 100%, we're all on board for one of those actions for next month. Sara, did you have um, any announcements at the end here that okay. you want to bring up? Yeah. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Sara, and I am a co-chair of the Youth Empowerment Committee under Respond Racism, where we are um, currently looking for new members. You can visit us for more information at rtr underscore youth on Instagram. And um, I just wanted to make our community aware of a few events happening near us soon. On September 18th, um, most of the day down in um, Millennium Plaza, we, the Lake Oswego um, City and Respond to Racism are partnering to have this beautiful cultural exchange um, with different food, different music, different, all kinds of different things from different cultures. And we'd really appreciate if you went, it's going to be really fun. It's gonna be a blast. We hope to see you there. Um, additionally, September 12th, which is um, also the date of a school board meeting, there will be a protest that has to do with our last um community meeting subject um at 6 30 to 8 30 which is the time of this meeting but we won't be having one so um we hope to see you there um and i really want to thank everyone for coming out today um, where is that located sarah oh it's located at forest hills elementary school at the yeah. board meeting yeah okay thank you um, and special thank you to Willie, our panelists, Pat, Don, Trina, and Pat, uh, and John. You guys are great. Thanks for doing this. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you all.